Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Uh, let's stand together to praise our God. Amen. Uh, hear this word from the Lord. Uh, we started with Psalm 103, and this is Psalm 103 beginning with verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Dear friends, trust in the promise of God and know that you are forgiven. Amen.
uh, this morning in our uh, prayer time. And, and by the way, I, I really encourage you uh, take the bulletin home as a prayer guide for the week and uh, pray for the items that are listed and uh, we have a different EPC congregation to pray for every week and of course we want to pray for the whole Church of Jesus Christ wherever it's found but uh, this week we're going to pray especially for the Hope Presbyterian Church of Rogue River, Oregon. Their, their pastor is Brian Boyson. And as always, I'm going to give you the opportunity to pray for people you're concerned about just by speaking their name aloud. I'll prompt you when we get there. So would you bow with me as I lead us in prayer? Lord Jesus, uh, thank you for that, those, those words that we just sang. We do love you, but only because you first loved us and, and gave yourself for us, the perfect sacrifice for sin. Uh, you, Lord Jesus, were sent into the world by the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit to begin your mighty work of a new creation that this broken and sin bound world would be restored to what you originally created it to be uh, that it would reflect your goodness and glory so we thank you for your saving work your that mighty work of redemption that you worked on the cross to take our place, to forgive our sin, to give us a new beginning. And we thank you for your resurrection victory, that death is a defeated enemy. It does not hold us captive, and the fear of death need not hold us captive. Uh, pour out your Holy Spirit Lord, uh, on our church today, uh, we pray your blessing on the, the adult Sunday school class that's going on right now. Um, pour out your Holy Spirit, open hearts uh, to receive uh, your teaching. We, we thank you for Bruce Levi and his leadership and ask that you bless him as he teaches this morning. Uh, we thank you for Ellen Combs and our uh, children's Sunday school and uh, Jeannie Hoover and all, 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 the, all of the others uh, that help out with children's Sunday school. Bless them. And we pray especially for our children, the Lord, our children and young people. We pray that they will grow strong in you, that their hearts will turn toward you, uh, that you will draw them to yourself uh, for a life, a, a lifetime journey of faith. Father, we uh, continue to lift before you our Associate Pastor Search Committee. Uh, and we thank you for each member of that committee. Thank you for Paul Cohen's leadership. Uh, we pray you will continue to guide them as they enter into uh, interviews and uh, Lord uh, we also ask that you will be preparing we, we know you've already selected the person who's going to come and be a part of uh, the leadership of our church and uh, we ask that you will bless that person and uh, prepare them uh, for ministry here Father, we pray uh, for all who are ill or uh, hurting in any way, whether in mind or body or spirit, and pray your healing. We 
Now, uh, all of you here, if, if you would like to pray for somebody this morning, just speak their name aloud right now. Now let's offer together the prayer that our Savior Jesus gave us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from you, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, if the ushers will please come forward, we'll receive our morning offering. Thank you for uh, your boundless generosity to us. Blessing after blessing you've given us, most of all, the gift of your Son, Jesus our Savior. So in his name now, uh, we ask that you make us a generous people and receive these gifts that we bring this morning, set them apart to do your work, and we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. And be seated. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Please stand with me. many 
or maybe you just influence one other person in your life, you have influence. And uh, so I'm going to talk about leadership today. And uh, as I said, we're going to talk about King Saul, but this requires a little bit of uh, historical background before I read the text. Uh, and by the way, the text is from 1 Samuel 15, and I'm going to begin with verse 13, if you've got your Bible with you. About 1,200 years before Christ. Uh, God liberated his people out of slavery in Egypt, led them out, as the Bible says, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And uh, then they wandered in the wilderness for about 40 years. And, uh, well, not about, for exactly 40 years. And God led them to the promised land, the land of Canaan. And uh, for the next about 200 years, there was no formal central government. It, uh, Israel was 12 tribes uh, uh, dispersed around the, uh, land of, the land of Canaan. And uh, there, there was very little in the way of centralized government. Th this is the period for about 200 years after the uh, conquest of Canaan, about 200 years, is known as the period of the judges. And uh, some, there are familiar names, uh, Gideon, Samson, uh, Deborah, one of the judges. And uh, the last of the judges was Samuel. And uh, it was during the time of Samuel that the people of Israel started to look around and they noticed that all of the other nations had kings. And uh, they wanted a king too. Uh, God said that was a bad idea, but God relented and said, all right, I'll pick a king for you. And, uh, God chose Saul. And as I said, Saul is a failed leader. The spirit of the Lord was withdrawn from him, and God anointed David to take his place. We're going to get to David next week. Um, and the text that I'm going to preach on this morning is from, well, as I said, from 1 Samuel 15. And this is the moment of crisis when God withdraws his spirit from sin for his unfaithfulness. And uh, just to set it, set it up a little bit more, uh, Saul had been ordered by God to drive out the Amalekites. The Amalekites were uh, a marauding, plundering people who were raiding uh, Hebrew villages. Saul drove them out, but God had specifically ordered Saul do not take any of the plunder, any of the spoil from the, Amal from the Amalekites. Destroy it all. Okay. Uh, but Saul fudged on that a little bit, a lot. Okay. So, hear now the word of God, 1 Samuel 15, 13. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you, to the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears and the lowing of oxen that I hear? Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. And the rest we had devoted to destruction. Then Samuel said to Saul, Stop! I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And, he, and Saul said to him, Speak. And Samuel said, Though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? 
The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go, devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. The word of the Lord. Would you bow with me? But God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> well, when, when Saul became king, Israel was in serious trouble. Uh, there were marauding bands of Amalekites who were plundering uh, Hebrew villages. And uh, it says uh, earlier in chapter 14, we're told that Saul fought against all of his enemies on every side. Uh, during, during the reign of King Saul, Israel was continually under siege. And, but we're also told Well, the text is clear that Saul was able to defend the Hebrew people only because the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. So it was really God who defended his people. It was really God who delivered his people. Well, God's prophet, Samuel, reminded Saul of this when he told him at the beginning of chapter 15, he said, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now, therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. Um, the definition of a godly leader. Now remember, I introduced this by saying you're all leaders. You, you may not feel like a leader, but you're an influencer. The definition of a godly leader is one who listens to the word of the Lord. Um, once again, we all lead in some way. You may have a position of influence over many people. You may have a position of influence over one person. Every Christian is called to leadership in some way. And you cannot know how to influence others unless you are listening to the word of the Lord. Throughout the Bible, God never says to anyone, when God gives an assignment to someone in the Bible, and God has given an assignment to you, God has given a calling to you to influence the people around you. And throughout the Bible, when God calls somebody and gives them a mission, God never says, here's your mission, uh, call me when you're done, and I'll evaluate your performance. No. Uh, the Holy Spirit comes upon that person to empower them and guide them. God is present with them for the mission that God gives. Uh, 
Samuel gave Saul some very specific instructions from the Lord. God told him to attack the Amalekites. And once again, they were a fierce tribe that was, you know, plundering and robbing from the people. And God gave very specific instructions to King Saul. No one was to keep any of the spoil. Uh, in other words, the, the livestock, the, the, the wealth the, that uh, the Amalekites might have, when you go and defeat them, you're not to keep any of that. It is all to be destroyed. Well, Saul uh, didn't obey that commandment. He ignored it because uh, he was listening to, the, listening to the people. And the people really, really, really wanted to keep all that good stuff. There was some really good livestock and uh, you know, sheep and oxen. And Saul was afraid of disappointing the people. And so he apparently thought, well, what can the harm be? Uh, they really want to keep this stuff. And so, well, why not? And it's good stuff. Well, what happened was, by disobeying the voice of the Lord, Saul became a plunderer no different than the Amalekites. Uh, and the people of God became plunderers keeping the spoil no different than the Amalekites. Well, the Lord saw all this, and the Lord said to Samuel, this is uh, in verse 10, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned his back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it was not long after that that the text says this, Spirit of the Lord was withdrawn from Saul, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon a young man named David. And as I said, next week we get to David. God wants to lead his people, and none of us is essential to that. If, if we are unfaithful, if we ignore the voice and leading of the Lord, God will find somebody else. Um, there's a name uh, that you may have heard before, Max Weber. Looks like Weber, but Weber. Uh, Max Weber was a famous sociologist uh, early in the 20th century. Um, he said, uh, it was his observation that there are three kinds of leadership in the world. Uh, the first he called traditional leadership, and that's uh, basically uh, royalty, aristocracy. Uh, in, the, in our country and, and in most of Western Europe, uh, we, we really don't practice that kind of leadership anymore. Uh, we don't have kings and princes and queens, and, uh, but and there, there are still some places in the world that have that traditional model of leadership. You're, you're born to leadership, you inherit leadership, and the people who are being led, they are born to their station in life, and uh, that's tr traditional leadership. Uh, Weber then said the second kind of leadership is what he called legal leadership. And that's the model uh, that we see uh, in our country and uh, in democratic uh, republics around the world, uh, where uh, we we choose the people choose a leader, and uh, there's like a contractual arrangement between the people and the leader. And uh, if the leader doesn't perform up to snuff. Uh, then they, they can get tossed out in, in the next election. Uh, 
that this is also the model of leadership that we are most comfortable with in church and uh, in the workplace. Uh, we, we choose our leader and uh, they either perform or, or they don't perform. Uh, and under, under this model, the leader must negotiate and compromise to get things done. And also, the leader must attend many, many, many committee meetings. But there's a third kind of leadership, Weber said. Uh, and I think he was very insightful here. Weber said that history often stumbles into a time when the traditional model of leadership doesn't work and the legal model of leadership doesn't work. And in those times, he said a third kind of leadership emerges, what he calls charismatic leadership, charismatic leadership. Uh, the charismatic leader is not bound to tradition, not bound to a contract with the people, but bound uh, to the internal charisma that animates that person. Uh, last week I talked about Winston Churchill. He was a charismatic leader that was raised up uh, to lead Great Britain in World War II and, and really in a way give leadership to all of the allies in World War II. Uh, but I would also point out Winston Churchill was a charismatic leader. So was Adolf Hitler. Uh, had that animating spirit that, uh, that the German people followed. But let's apply Weber's model of the charismatic leader. Let's apply that to biblical leadership. Let's apply it to Christian leadership and Christian in, your Christian influence in, in the world. Your being salt, your being light to others. The word charismatic does not mean being flashy or attractive. It actually comes from the Greek word charis, which means either grace or gift. The truly charismatic leader is not bound to the people. Brothers and sisters, our, our world, our families, our communities, our workplaces need charismatic influencers. People who have the Spirit of God in them in a way that touches others. There's something liberating about following someone who is bound, not bound to tradition and not bound to us. Um, think of, uh, well, obviously the, obviously the greatest example is Jesus Christ himself. His leadership is not traditional, certainly not legal, but charismatic in the deepest sense. Um, but there's other examples in the Bible, and the same is true of the Apostle Paul and the leadership he gave the early church. Uh, the same is true of uh, the leadership of uh, great influencers of the Reformation, Martin Luther, John Calvin, um, when I think of charismatic leadership, uh, an example for me that I'd like to share with you that goes way back in my journey of faith, uh, I, I, I thought this week of somebody that you've never heard of named Frank Stenzel. 
Uh, Frank Stenzel was the director of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship at Fresno State in the 1970s when I was a student there. Frank uh, is Frank is still living, by the way. I, I think he's probably in his early 80s by now. Uh, he's raising kiwi fruit in Northern California as his retirement project. Frank is not the kind of person who would wow you with his dynamic persona. Uh, he was thin of hair and broad of middle, uh, as I am now. He was not what business leaders would call a driver, uh, but Frank influenced hundreds and hundreds of college students because he was filled up with the Spirit of God. And Frank was not captive to the students he was leading. He wasn't trying to please them. He would rather tell the truth than make people feel good. He would rather do the right thing than the popular thing. He would rather be faithful than be admired. And when I was a college student, I saw that in him. You know, when, when somebody leads in that way, you recognize it immediately. And when I was a college student, I, I would have followed him anywhere. The, the deadliest trap in leadership is to need the approval of the people you lead. Because when a leader operates that way, needing the approval of the people that they're leading, uh, guess what? That leader is operating out of fear. Fear of losing that approval. King Saul was afraid of his own people. He was afraid of losing their approval. And so when they conquered the Amalekites and took the livestock and the people wanted to keep the livestock, Saul, oh, they won't like me if I tell them we need to kill all the livestock. He was operating out of fear. And when Samuel then, uh, the last of the judges, remember, was Samuel. When Samuel confronted Saul, Saul protested. He said, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel asked him, <laughs> and this, this actually would be kind of funny if it wasn't so serious. Samuel asked him, Oh, you've performed what the Lord told you. What is this bleating of sheep that I hear and the lowing of oxen that I hear? Then Saul compounded his guilt by cooking up a phony excuse. He said, I spared the best of the sheep and oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. Now, he gave himself away in that sentence. Did you hear it? He betrayed his heart. He, he showed something about his heart in that sentence. Did you hear it? I saved out the best of the animals to sacrifice to the Lord your God Samuel, not my God, your God. And Samuel was fed up at that point. He, he just, he said, stop, just stop. Does God need sheep and oxen? And then he uttered a, he uttered a truth that echoes throughout the whole Bible. He said, to obey is better than sacrifice. Uh, I said that echoes through the whole Bible. Jesus said much, uh, said much the same thing. He, he said, mercy is better than sacrifice. 
and, and by the way, some of you will probably remember uh, uh, an old song, uh, Keith Green. I'm, I'm dating myself by mentioning the name Keith Green, who wrote a beautiful song uh, called To Obey is Better Than Sacrifice. <clears throat> We, we make a lot of pointless sacrifices trying to make other people happy. And speaking of burnt offerings, you can burn yourself out very quickly trying to make other people happy. It's a dead end uh, because, well, I'm including myself among the people the people will never be satisfied. If you begin, like Saul, to operate on the basis of trying to make people happy, that's a bottomless pit. It will never end. The reason we fall into that trap, trying to please others, is that we're operating out of fear. We're operating out of fear of rejection. Whether whether you, once again, whether you influence hundreds of people or whether you just influence one and you're trying to please them rather than letting the Spirit of God work through you. Saul was chosen by God, but he ended up being so afraid that he forgot the God who had called him to lead and he said, the Lord your God, not his God. He listened to the voice of the people instead of the voice of God, and in that moment, he lost his calling. God removed Saul and placed David on the throne of Israel. Now, David was a deeply flawed human being. Uh, big mistakes, big sins. But his heart, why does, with all of his faults and failures, why does the Bible call David a man after God's own heart? Because with all of his faults and all of his failings, his heart was like a compass that just pointed to true north. His heart was directed toward God. And his heart was filled up with, with God. You cannot influence anybody in a godly direction if you're more afraid of people than you are of God. Let me repeat that. You cannot influence anybody in a godly direction if you're more afraid of people than you are of God. Remember, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And it's not terrified fear. It's not cowering fear. It's the awe and wonder of God filling up your field of vision. Saul's vision was filled with the people he desperately wanted to please. And that's why he failed. Now, what's the antidote to fear? Uh, the world will tell you, courage. Just be tough. Right? Get a spine. Get a backbone. What's the biblical antidote to fear? We heard it. A few moments ago, David read it from 1 John. There is no fear in love. But perfect love, and there's only one perfect love, and that's the love of God given to us through Jesus Christ. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear. It's love that's stronger than fear. It's the love of God that's stronger than fear. 
Because the love of God, when it fills us up, extends out from us to touch others. First John goes on to say, you, you can't say you love God and hate your brother or sister. You are called to influence others. Like, as I said, you may not think of yourself as a leader. You are called to influence others. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You influence others. And if you try to do that on your own strength, you will eventually run out of your own resources. And uh, God forbid that we would end up like Saul. That's the wrong turn that he took. He's an example for us, a, a negative example. We have a choice. We can choose to try to please the people who look to us, or we can fall on our knees and say, Father, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your love. Cast out my fear with your love. The only way to influence others for Christ is to be so filled up with the Spirit of God that others will recognize that it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about Him. Let's pray together. Father, uh, we thank you for this uh, warning from your word. This, this warning in the story of King Saul. Deliver us from that kind of fear, O oh God, and fill us with your, fill us with the power and love of your Holy Spirit. Deliver us from being pleasers and make us servants of our King Jesus. We pray it in the strong and precious name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. We're going to uh, affirm our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. If you'll please stand as you are able. Church, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He descended into heaven and is seated at the right hand.
uh, brief announcements. Uh, first of all, uh, our adult Sunday school class taught by Bruce Levi goes one more Sunday, and uh, you can jump in for the last Sunday if you want. Uh, Christ Presbyterian women are having their taco lunch on Saturday, October 16th, and there's a sign up right over here. Is today the last day to sign up, Charlotte? Today is the last day to get signed up, and you don't want to miss that. It's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, we have a new member in choir class coming up, uh, and the date's here in the bulletin. And uh, it says sign up at the information table, but I don't think we have a sign up sheet. Maybe I can come up with one. Okay, and. Uh, Next week, we will have the Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes and the literature that goes with it. Uh, we got the shoe boxes this week, but not the literature. And so we're going to pass those out next week. And uh, go now in peace. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit, and may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon you now and abide with you evermore. Amen. Church, where are you going? We go forth to serve God's glory as those who love our glory and Savior, Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Amen.